and welcome to Actual Electrical Content. How the devil are you? Have you had a good week? My name is Jamie. Thank you very much for joining me as I take you on another exciting bit of Actual Electrical Content. What we'll do today is I got some gifts. Uh, I mentioned the other week that I went to a guy called Mark's house and met his lad as well. He was there called Elliot and they gave me some of the fantastic gifts you might see in here. For example, that that fuse board over there, which is slightly out of shot because that's it's shot up properly. One second. It's not easy being the most informative electrical channel on the internet. I got that fuse board off from over there. That's an original brand new in box domestic fuse board from God knows what year. I'm gonna do a separate video on that, so don't worry about that now. Don't worry about the ammeter. That's just to make this set look nice because obviously it's just a set. I'm sat in front of a piece of rubber brick wallpaper on. But he gave me this, uh, his son Elliot gave me this. And he gave me because he says, oh, it's really good this is because I'll zoom in now and I'll show the side of it. It's got a perspex side. And what I'm going to go through today is normally open and normally closed. Because people say it all the time, normally open, normally closed. What the fuck does that mean and why? I'm just going to go right back and discuss it with you. But first I'm going to show you this contact that's been donated here so you can see how I'm going to show you it. So Elliot gave me this and he quite rightly identified it'd be most useful to me, but for more reasons than he thought actually, he thought it'd be most useful to me because of this perspex side look. And in there you can see, or you should be able to see, you can see the contacts look coming across. There's a contact, there's a contact. And there's a contact in position there that's normally closed and they're open. And when I press it, look, you'll be able to see those contacts move and change. I'm just going to do this a few times because this will go on YouTube. It'll be a much better edit. There'll be more to it than that. But you can see there's a press down on the contactor activator button here, which is like a manual way of operating the contactor. You can see that one's going down as well. And you can see within there that those contacts are moving and changing. And you can really tell that what's really important here is you see the top contact, this one here, that breaks and is broken before the other ones make and are made. That is a design feature. So this one, the fact that this one breaks before these two are made is a design feature. And it's important to remember that. So already we're in the wormhole where this normally open, normally closed. It's a very simple thing to say something is normally open. So it's it's like the switch is like that. Or it's normally closed, which means it's like that. Those positions will be shown in their normally dead state de-energised. Yeah? So for this example, for example, on this one, we'd show this one here, which is normally closed physically, as normally closed. And we draw it normally closed. And we'd show these ones as normally open. Then we get to a tricky situation where these are these are what they call interlock. These are connected together. There's there's a connection between here, and when it's when the mechanical force is applied, it breaks the top one like that, but doesn't quite make the bottom one look. So they are totally isolated contacts. That opens and then they close. And I think they close at the same time. They look like they close about the same time. But you could get a switch where. One of them's making before the other one's breaking. And there's loads to go at. So don't be confused. So he gave it me for the clear side. But what I will add to this, and it's useful if you can ever find one of these. This is a contactor made by a company called MTE. And I've, I've worked on these. I don't know if you can still get these or what. But I, it's not something I'm super familiar with. But I know I've worked on these. And I think they're like an 80s remnant. I suspect these are a very high quality contactor from the 80s. But I don't know. So I'm open to people telling me the comments. And my comment section is an absolute wealth of information. There are regularly people putting stuff in there. This is the last type of contactor before... This is what I would call a sub-miniature contactor. As in, it's miniaturised and made to a price. Yeah, Made small. Big contactors originally. And I would interrupt the photo if I could find one. Big open frame things where things are clunking together. This was an effort to make them modular, and now they are extremely modular. So you can't take apart a modern contactor, really. The general ones you get, they don't come apart. Whereas this one, the top comes off. Which reveals the top section. And then amazingly, the contact section comes off to reveal the contacts inside. And then the core, so I want to work backwards through this while we're here. So in the bottom, You'll find the coil. There's the magnetic plates lot that form part of the magnet. The other half of that is there. And that is the coil just there. 
there's the coil section so you could replace that. So first of all, you could probably buy this bit and buy the coil for it. And you could put that in. I don't know what size coil that is, but it'll probably come in 10, uh, 12, 24, 110, 240 volts. So you place that coil in there and then you put the terminals in. Therefore, you would select the coil. Oh, it's 110. It's got it on the back. It says 110 just down there. I might check with the photo. But that is now a 110 volt electromagnet. And that exists to pull down this section which is the contact section. So we've dealt with that. That is merely the mounting. It's for mounting and it's for coiling, for pulling the physical things down. That then acts upon this bit under here. Look, the rest of the thing is there. Whoa, bits of fun. So when that coil is energized, it wants to shut this thing. So it pulls down on this. It pulls down that other part of that laminated steel core, which comes downwards like that. And the action of that being pulled downwards moves the switches in here like this lock. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna put that back together. So we know that the coil makes these laminates come together. There's a spring return here, lock. There's a spring to make it open itself up automatically. So let me put this back together so things stop falling out and I can show you the mechanicalness and what this contact actually does within itself. So that's back together now. So you can see the actual, so what we know now is the, there's a magnetic, electromagnetic switch in there, coil type thing that wants to drag this down when it's energized. So when it's energized, it wants to pull the mechanics down. You can see it acting on here. I know it's all black, it's not easy, but it pulls it down. That then is connected to these three contacts here, which are your L1, your L2, and your L3. So when you energize the coil, it pulls these down. And you can see up close, if I get it at a right angle, look, you see those points there? And it'll just pull it in. So basically, a contactor is a collection of three normally open contacts well it's six really because you have linking bars because you have this bar situation in the middle look you've got them that side and that side so it's but it's three phases through so hi it's in the edit me the reason it's not a switch like that with one contact surface is because there'd be one contact surface by over those linking bars that link two contact services the arc is quenched over the two surfaces so as they come together last minute the arc is drawn the fixed amount of energy in the arc is moved across two individual arcs thus reducing how bad it is so it doesn't erode the contacts all the time. That's why we do it. You put it into the coil and it closes. And that is kept open because obviously the motor on the end of it needs the three phases to turn. Or whatever is on the end of it, really. It could, it's not normally a motor, but it could be a, a board or something. So, so yeah, you put a small voltage in and it's capable of switching because this could be this big or it could be, I don't know, as big as a fucking briefcase. And it pulls these closed to start your motor. And I know what you're thinking. Why would you want normally closed? Why would you want normally open? Well, they're normally open because when they're open, it doesn't run. And when you energise it, they do run. Contactors are always normally open. But, obviously on the side, you've got this bit, which we're going to go into next. But just to finish it off, seems very open, yeah. This bit's the arc chute. It's got the quenching things in. So, if there's any arcing or spark as these come in, they're there to quench the arc and cover the top up. So, let me put the entire thing back together. That's the inside of the contact. If you're watching this on YouTube, there'll be B-roll of this. Uh, at the end or in here now but yeah we've got the normally open bits we get that because we're switching the motor on in three phases three off switches that become three on switches when you apply the current to the coil but what about this bit why normally open normally closed and why relays normally open normally closed so now we've gone over how the contact to works yeah why these contacts well this thing on the side which is here it's independent of the contact the contact is just these three terminals that's all it is this lump on the side is what they call an auxiliary block. It provides auxiliary contacts, which are only suitable for control voltages. You can't use these to switch anything like a motor or anything like that. That's what the contactor does. But the auxiliary block is able to provide contacts that indicate the state mechanically of the contactor. So, for example, this block here, this auxiliary block here, they could just as easily be one on the other side as well. And they also, on some contactors, are ones that fit on the top here. You'll have seen them if you're ever into contactors, and I'll be interjecting here right now in this gap that's being formed here with some other examples of auxiliary blocks. But they're either side mount, you can get front mount, and you get top mount. There's, there's loads of different types, but it's always called an auxiliary block. And what they do is, these can provide normally open or normally closed contacts to indicate what's going off. First of all, the computer is part of a doll starter. A doll is a direct online starter where when you press start, the motor starts, and when you press stop, the motor stops. And in the meantime, the contactor holds in to enable running continuously. I'm going to come back to that because that's going to be a drawing on the whiteboard. But what I will say on this one is, let's look at this normally open contact here. You put from your PLC voltage into the coil. And what you expect to happen is you expect the contactor to pull in like that. 
and energise the motor and the motor will run. The crudest, easiest way of telling someone or a control system or a lamp or anything electrical that the motor is running is to use this normally open switch here to provide positive feedback. So when the motor is running, you would expect, unless something's seriously wrong, if the contactor is pulled in, the power is being provided to the motor when it's running. So you can use this contact here that's normally open. So that would be, yeah, so that would not be running because the contact is not made. And when it pulls down, that would be running. Now, obviously, that's assuming that the cables that leave here go to the motor and that the motor's working. If it went for an isolator, you'd have another auxiliary contact on the isolator and it'd do the same thing. So this would have to pull in and let the electricity through this. Then it'd have to go through the isolator and go through that and feed back. Let's jump to the draw board now because we're here to talk about normally close and normally open while we use them. And we need to get to the weeds on why this would work. So let's look at that feedback on this. Here's how it works. We've got a plus 24 volt signal available here. 24 volts. Then we've got the control system in the middle. And at the end, we've got a terminal that our PLC says run. What you don't realise is, is I'm using the forward facing camera. So I've had to write all these back to front. Anyhow, the 24 volts gets taken to not to the contactor because the contacts are the control. We have three stages of controller motor. We have the feed, then we have the protection, then we have the control, then we have the motor. So first of all, we'll have a feed going to the protection, which is an overload relay, and that will have normally closed and normally open contacts on. When it is not tripped, when it is healthy, it will probably have a normally closed contact. So we'll take it through that normally closed contact, which means when it's healthy, power will go through the protection, the protection, and get to the next stage. What I've done here during that interview is put it through the board. Also, all of this is drawn backwards because I'm on the front front camera. So you've got the power feed here, you've got your L1, your L2, and your L3, which are maybe the right way around. They go through an overload, which has normally open and normally closed contacts on. As I said, when the overload is healthy, it's closed. So the power gets through to here. At the contactor, which is the item we've just been looking at, when it's open, the contact's open. When the motor runs, it's closed. So what we do is we take it through that contact on the contactor so that when that closes, the power gets to here. But it's still not time to run because there's one last bit, that's the isolator. On the isolate, you have an initial contact, an auxiliary block. When the contact is open, the contact's open. When the contact is closed, the contact is closed. So when it's open, you can't ever run. But when you close the contactor and everything's done, you'll get the run signal back to your PLC, which is positive feedback to tell you your motor's running. And as you'll get to see now, this, I'll change colour pen, above this blue line is the mains. That's the mains that gets the motor to run. You've got your three phases going through your overload or fuses, going through your contactor, going through your isolator, going to your motor. They are totally physically separate, apart from mechanical interlocking to the control side, which has got a normally open, normally closed auxiliary contact on the, on the overload, a normally closed, normally open auxiliary contact on the contactor, and a normally open, normally closed contact on the isolator. When they're all in the healthy state and they're all pulled in, the PLC or a light, that could be a green light that gets told, yeah, it's running and that lights up to tell you that the motor's running because you might have got to physically see it. But what if, for example, this was tripped or something like that? So now I've had another bit of control circuitry. I've took the 24 volts to the other contact, the normally open contact on the trip on the protection on the overload device. So you can see when it's healthy, it allows the power to go through to complete the run circuit. When it trips, it flip flops these contacts, the normally open becomes the normally closed and vice versa, and brings on this trip lamp. So then on the front of a control panel, you can see it's tripped. The normally open and normally closed contacts that are auxiliaries, they are not connected to the main side are what forms the basis of all control. Without them, there is nothing. We can't start tapping off the mains, it's dangerous. This can be any voltage. This can be whatever voltage you want. As long as you collect all the controls from the same voltage, you can have this safer system run alongside, sort everything out for you. So now when you're looking around at electronics and electrical components, you'll see that this overload, which is a 16 to 25 amp overload, that is power on, 
when it trips it does that and you'll see there's this section here well the trick is this section here removes and that is an auxiliary block and you'll see on it look it's got a normally open and a normally closed contact and that is just to provide contacts for switching you don't need it it'll work fine without it but when you add it you can now get positive feedback on what position it is in so when it is normally when it is normally open it will be a commentary around it but basically they flip flop one's normally open one's normally closed in that position when you turn it on they flip across one's normally used for the trip and one's normally used for the healthy or whatever you want really but that is an auxiliary block in example i haven't got for these relays but let me get another one out wait there and now we see that this contactor, which has got L1, L2, L3, and its own onboard normally open, and then the core voltages. Well, if you need more than one normally open, that normally open is provided for the direct online method, which I'm going to explain to you tomorrow. You can assemble them like this. So here's the contact block mounted on, so I can just pull that off that one. And I can place it on top of that one, like that. And then when that contact pulls in and shuts these three contacts, I'll get normally open, normally open, normally closed, normally closed loads more terminals to give indication of what's actually going off so whatever they're called they're just auxiliary blocks because they provide auxiliary contacts because they're auxiliary to the main function which is switching the power there and auxiliary to the main function which is switching the power through this overload there's one other option you're going to see them in let me show you that this is a push button it's just a red push button no matter what color it is at the minute because many to explain the contacts but when you press it it acts upon this block beneath it which is called a contact block Looking at that, we can see it's the normally open one. It's green. That's generally the standard. When you push the button, it pushes through and activates inside there to make a normally open contact become normally closed. The good thing about these ones is, these Schneider ones, which were telling me has been around for years, is you can add blocks on. So you can stick a block in there, look like that. They're a bit of a bastard trying to do it through the camera, but you can, ah, oh, here we go. This might get edited up in YouTube, but you can just clip that on there. You can. Let's bear with me on this to doing this for a camera lens there you go and that clicks on there now you've got two being acted upon and then the best bit is you can get the red one which is a normally open so normally closed and you can have that they just stack there you go i've stacked three of them that's quite a hard button to press now i'm not saying they basically you can stack them infinitely i suppose but obviously after a certain point there's enough mechanical slack in the linkages that the m1s won't work i'm not sure the actual specifications for how many you can link but I've certainly had five. It's a hard press. And after five, you'd be filling your panel so you do something else. But that's how they work. Looking in there, I've got a normally open, a normally closed, a normally open, or whichever way around it is. And when I press it, look, it acts on the end. So, yeah, that's the other way of using normally open, normally closed contacts to get start and stop buttons, which I'm going to cover tomorrow when I do doll starting with normally closed, normally open contacts and auxiliary blocks. That is a brief introduction to normally open, normally closed. Every single piece of electromechanical control equipment used in control panels has auxiliaries that act normally open or normally closed, which help the control system control itself. And that is all separate from the mains. We don't generally take the mains cables to monitor, say, the rotation of a motor. It can be done in certain circumstances, but generally we do it with auxiliaries. So there'll be some B-roll this up close. That's auxiliaries. I'm going to show you a prime example of our auxiliaries work tomorrow when I do doll starts. I've got to go back, back and do some actual work now. But yeah, when you look at the drawers, which I'm also going to put up, you'll be able to look at them and go, oh, this main job is to be a protective device. But it's got little auxiliaries that give stuff. So that is one of the main important things about being a controls engineer. Get told about it all the time and I'll leave you with a picture of this going up and down like your mum's dildo.